Welcome to our roundtable discussion on combating discriminatory seclusion practices, hosted by the Department of Justice's Civil Rights Division. We're glad that you could attend this program. My name is Karen Love, and I'm a civil rights analyst in the division's educational opportunities section, and your moderator for today's discussion. We'll get started after a few housekeeping items. Today, we'll hear remarks from Civil Rights Division's Assistant Attorney General, Kristen Clark, followed by a panel discussion on the use of seclusion in schools and the division's work in this area. Following this discussion, we'll take questions from the audience. Please put your questions in the Q&A located in the bottom row of your Zoom window at any time during the panel discussion. Please note that we may not be able to get to all of the questions. This event is live captioned. If you'd like to view the captions, you can toggle that setting in the bottom row of your Zoom window in the CC icon. We are recording this event. We may post it on our intranet or external websites. It may also be used for training purposes. With that, it's my pleasure to introduce Assistant Attorney General Kristen. Good morning. Uh First, I want to welcome everyone to this important roundtable discussion that's focused on uh, steps necessary to combat discriminatory seclusion practices in schools. This program is hosted by the United States Department of Justice's Civil Rights Division. And as noted, my name is Kristen Clark. I'm the Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights. And one of the Civil Rights Division's core missions is ensuring that all students whether enrolled in K to 12 schools or colleges and universities are guaranteed their right to equal educational opportunities enshrined in federal law. As a result, the work of the division's educational opportunities section spans the entire country and includes investigations into discrimination based on race, color, national origin, sex, religion, and especially relevant to our topic today, disability. America's students face daunting obstacles in the era of post-pandemic recovery. Against the backdrop of lingering trauma, schools have dealt with students' heightened social, emotional, mental health, and academic needs. Many thousands of educators across the country have dedicated their careers to meeting these needs. And we recognize that they work tirelessly in increasingly difficult environments, often at great personal cost, toward the goal of supporting all students and helping them succeed. But the reality is that sometimes our schools fall short of that goal. According to nationwide data from the U.S. Department of Education, in the 2017 to 2018 school year, over 27,000 students were subject to seclusion, meaning they were involuntarily confined alone in spaces that they were not free to leave. The vast majority of these seclusions involved students with disabilities. Seclusion is associated with a wide array of psychological, social, and physical harm to students. When Students are secluded. They often are placed in empty, padded cells without access to their peers, without access to supports, and without access to education. Seclusion can escalate rather than de-escalate a child's behavior, causing them to engage in self-harm and leaving lasting psychological scars. And too often, this happens because a school simply fail to provide the student with the necessary services and supports to ensure success. And that's why the Civil Rights Division has made it a priority to identify, investigate, and end the discriminatory use of seclusion in school districts across our country. Like all students, students with disabilities have individual challenges, but seclusion cannot be the shortcut for dealing with that behavior. It cannot be a substitute for classroom management, and it cannot deprive students with disabilities of the education that they are entitled to receive. 
Instead, instead, school staff must have the necessary training and support to help students, particularly those with disabilities that may make their behavior especially challenging. The division's enforcement efforts have sought to bring about such transformation and to end discrimination against students with disabilities. We've entered into settlements with over half a dozen school districts across the country that serve hundreds of thousands of students from Alaska to Maryland, all of which have prohibited seclusion. These settlements also require comprehensive reforms to make sure that students are getting the help they need before crises occur. With these tools, school staff can more readily treat high need students with the care that the students need and that these staff members went into education to provide. President Lyndon Johnson stated that equal, equality of educational opportunity is the birthright of every citizen. Secluding students because of their disabilities denies them such equal opportunity. It deprives them of rights guaranteed to them under the Americans with Disabilities Act. The Justice Department will not tolerate such mistreatment of students with disabilities. We will not allow them to be locked out of educational opportunity. And you can help. If you know of discriminatory seclusion that is happening at a school or inside of a school district, or if your family experienced such treatment, we ask that you reach out to the Civil Rights Division. One of my colleagues will place a link to our complaint portal in the chat. Together, we can make sure that every student has the supports that they need to remain in the educational environment to feel valued and cherished, and to achieve the success that they so rightly deserve. With that, I wanna thank you for attending this discussion and encourage you to consider ways to take what you hear and learn today to your schools at home. Thank you. Thank you, Assistant Attorney General Clark. We have the honor of having with us an impressive panel on the topic of seclusion and its effect on students and schools. With us today, we have Dr. Candice Mulcahy, an Associate Professor of Special Education at Binghamton University, State University of New York. Her research interests include education policies and practices that lead to school exclusion for children and adolescents with learning and behavioral concerns. She has coordinated and implemented professional development in public schools, alternative education, and juvenile corrections. Dr. Mulcahy has also consulted with state and local agencies on the provision of appropriate education services to at-risk and incarcerated youth. Jeanette Lobeck is in her third year as an intervention coordinator for the North Gibson School Corporation in Indiana. Jeanette earned a bachelor's in elementary education from Indiana State University and a master's in educational leadership and administration from Indiana Wesleyan University. Jeanette has been in public education for 27 years, 17 as a teacher in both general education and special education settings, and 10 years as an administrator. Dr. Michael Wilson has worked for over 20 years in the fields of education, behavior, and juvenile justice. He has served as an education and behavior expert in investigations of academic and behavioral programming in public schools and correctional settings around the country. Dr. Wilson has taught graduate courses focused on the intersections of race, disability, and school policy at the University of Maryland and Columbia University. He is also a former high school teacher in suburban Washington, DC, where he taught algebra and government to students with behavior disorders. Christy Kimmel is a parent whose son was excessively secluded and restrained in public school. Christy worked with the DOJ during the investigation of their county school system, which ultimately resulted in an agreement that the district would prohibit seclusion. Guy Stevens is the founder and executive director of the Alliance Against Seclusion and Restraint, AASR, 
a nonprofit he started in 2019. AASR is a community of over 25,000 parents, self-advocates, teachers, school administrators, paraprofessionals, attorneys, related service providers, and others working together to influence change in supporting children whose behaviors are often misunderstood. He has presented at conferences and events across North America and guest lectures for undergraduate and graduate courses on the issue of restraint and seclusion. Finally, Jonathan Newton is a Deputy Chief in the Civil Rights Division's Educational Opportunities Section, where he has led investigations on a wide variety of education-related topics, including seclusion, for 10 years. Before joining the division, Jonathan was a litigation associate for a private law firm in New York. Jonathan received his AB in government from Harvard University and his JD from Columbia Law School, where he was an articles editor for National Black Law Journal. Welcome panelists, and thank you for joining us. The first question that I have is for Michael Wilson. Michael, since some of the audience may not be familiar with seclusion, can you explain to us what it is? Uh, yeah, thanks, Karen, by the way, just to start off and, and everyone, it's, it's good to be here. Um, so seclusion is the involuntary confinement of students um, in a room where they are prevented from leaving. Um, technically, I guess the definition is physically prevented from leaving, uh, which is um, part of what ends up sort of constructing some of the problems around seclusion and what we know about the uh, prevalence of seclusion. Um, as the Assistant Attorney General pointed out to us, uh, about 27,000 students are secluded um, as, as recently as 2018. Um, but uh, that number um, is likely underestimated um, because of issues around reporting. Being, the first being it self-report uh, and the education uh, department doesn't have uh, currently a process for sort of checking to see if the numbers that are reported are are accurate um so you know things like a number of small districts in particular report zero seclusions each year uh which is unlikely um and so you know and and issues of definitional issues of uh districts and and teachers and paras not have quite understanding uh, what seclusion is, uh, presents a lot of problems with the reporting of seclusion data each year. Um, but that essentially is, is seclusion and the problems we are, or one of the problems we are facing with understanding seclusion and uh, combating and reducing seclusion in schools. Thanks, Michael. Candace, can you tell us why and when school districts use seclusion? Is there a population of students who are most affected? Sure. Uh, in theory, uh, seclusion is used as a safety measure for any behavior that presents an imminent risk of harm. And that's harm to self or harm to others. However, in practice, uh, it's often used inappropriately for low-level behaviors such as non-compliance, um, and then it's in that way used as a punishment for those behaviors. And these are behaviors that could have been prevented by positive behavior intervention support or behaviors that could have been addressed by de-escalation or in some cases, um, restraint. In my work and in uh, current research, including research from the Civil Rights uh, Data Collection System, uh, students with disabilities are uh, in large ways, disproportionately secluded in schools. And then uh, also black students and those students who are in elementary tend to be secluded more often. Thanks, Candace. Guy, your organization advocates against seclusion. What geographic area do you focus on and how many families have you worked with? Uh, Karen, I just wanna begin by, by thanking you and the Department of Justice 
uh, for all the work that you're doing on this topic. I mean, this is a critical topic uh, and uh, I really appreciate the work that's being done and not only the work that's being done, uh, you know, how it's being done because it's having a lot of impact. Uh, so as you identified, you know, we do advocate against seclusion. Uh, and I will say that from our um, viewpoint, uh, seclusion is never an appropriate intervention. Uh, putting a child uh, in a room or area against their will and not letting them out is something that should never happen. And uh, unfortunately, it happens far too often. And as an organization, uh, we end up helping and serving a lot of people that have been affected by this. In terms of geographic area, uh, we work, <laughs> it's interesting, when I started the organization, uh, I started in Maryland, which is my home state. Uh, I never necessarily intended to start an organization. I did it because of an experience that my son had uh, with seclusion and restraint. But today we really work around the world. Uh, we work with a lot of people here in the United States. We've worked with uh, hundreds of families across the country. We work with others in Canada and other places throughout the, the, the world. Uh, from New Zealand to the UK to Australia. This is an issue that's not uniquely American, uh, but certainly uh, we have a pretty big issue here in that we have no federal law around the use of restraint and seclusion in schools around the country, which is really kind of a significant problem. So uh, I've had the the uh, privilege of working with a lot of families. Unfortunately, I wish I didn't have the privilege of working with families that were experiencing this, probably uh, a number of whom are, are watching today. Uh, and it's something that at the end of the day, I think we can do better and we can reduce and eliminate restraint and seclusion uh, and do much better for our families and our educators as well. Yeah, you touched on this a little bit, but um, can you tell us a bit in your experience as an advocate, how prevalent is seclusion? Well, uh, you know, Karen, you, you might know that uh, the answer for me will be that one instance of seclusion is probably too many. Uh, when you put a child in a room area against their will and refuse to let them out, it's often done under the guise of calming. You know, this is a child that's dysregulated. We need to put them in this area. Uh, and somehow we're going to take a magic, you know, magically take a kid who's dysregulated and by forcing them into a room by themselves and holding the door shut, they will come out regulated. There's there's no uh, validity to that, of course. Uh, kids go in those rooms and they scream and they bang and they try to get out. Uh, perhaps in 20 or 30 minutes, they begin to quiet down as they, they begin to shut down. Their brain actually begins to go into a protective setting. Uh, and kids even dissociate in those rooms. So, of course, I would say that one instance of seclusion is too many. Uh, but what we know is it happens far too often around the country in, in many schools. We are seeing some progress. We have seen states that are beginning to prohibit the use of seclusion. That's certainly a minority right now, but we are seeing those efforts. Of course, the Department of Justice investigations have led to the elimination of seclusion in schools. Uh, it's hard to put numbers on these things. And of course, when we we go to the federal numbers that we have uh, around restraint and seclusion, what we know is those numbers are off probably by magnitudes of order. Uh, and that's not just a, an opinion that I have as an advocate, but the Government Accountability Office as well came out in 2009 and said there's a lot of issues with data. I've looked at state data, which if you were to believe the state data, uh, for small states, it might make up as much as 20% of what the federal data reports uh, the federal data is is really far off. So how often does it happen? It's really hard to say. I would say even in, with families who have gotten reports about restraint and seclusion happening to their children, uh, very often for every seclusion you hear about, there are many cases that happen that you hear nothing about. And it is traumatizing to kids and families. Thanks, Guy. Candace, back to you. Is seclusion an effective way of addressing behavior? So there's no current research that supports the use of seclusion as a means to reduce or eliminate uh, challenging behaviors in schools. There's no educational benefit and there's no therapeutic benefit to seclusion. In fact, um, research does support, and, and I've seen this in um, investigations I've been a part of and others I'm sure have as well, it tends to lead and um, lead to or reinforce trauma responses uh, and escalated behaviors. In some cases, students are physically uh, injured, uh, they increase self-harm behavior, and they may increase uh, aggressive or other um, types of behaviors. 
Thanks. And my next question for you is going to be about what the research said. So I want to make sure you feel like you covered that or if you had anything you wanted to add on that. Yeah, I, I there unfortunately uh, studies on seclusion in public schools and uh, that most of our students are going to are absent from the research base. There's a lot of reasons for this. Um, it's not a topic that school districts are going to be open to saying, yeah, come on in, use our data. Um, but it is something that's it's sorely needed. Uh, as others have mentioned already, the most reliable source of data that we have is the civil rights data collection. Um, and as others have also pointed out, that those data are underreported, and we don't have a good sense of the experiences and actually what happens from those numbers. Um, so without available school-based research, what I have done and what others uh, that do similar work have done is look at research that's been conducted in psychiatric facilities and residential treatment centers. Use of seclusion in those settings has been associated with physical injury or death, just as that has been reported in the news in public schools, um, increase in challenging behavior and development of new behaviors, and then also trauma-associated behaviors. We have reports of students doing things like urinating and defecating in those rooms. And I just want to add um, that it's not just rooms that are called seclusion rooms. These could be things, just as Guy had mentioned, that are called calming rooms or regulation rooms. It really doesn't matter the name of the room if it's being used in a way that is um, keeping the student in without them having agency to, to leave. Uh, it, it is seclusion. Thank you. Christy, I'm coming to you. As a parent whose child experienced seclusion, can you tell us how you found out what was happening? Uh, yes, I um, originally um, found out via a form that was sent home in his backpack that had um, been filled out by staff that he was secluded. It gave the length of the time, uh, what the behaviors were that he um, was sent to seclusion, and then what his behaviors were while he was in seclusion. And um, after those papers came home, I uh, requested meetings with uh, school staff. And what was the impact of the repeated seclusions on your son? Um, there were uh, 211 reported seclusions in a seven month period. And um, the seclusion impacted all of his functioning. He um, stopped verbalizing. He started breaking windows, breaking TVs, self-harming, hitting himself in the legs and the arms, screaming. Uh, he wouldn't, um, we wouldn't be able to go into an elevator because uh, being in an enclosed space was very traumatic for him. Um, he had, he started to, um, recoil when I would go to touch him, um, and, uh, he just became very aggressive. It impacted every facet of his being. I want to thank you so much for sharing those experiences with us so that we can center the experiences of our kids and in, in our discussion and, and keep them in the front of our minds when we're talking about this topic. So thank you. Guy, would you say the same was true for the families you worked with? What was the impact of seclusion on those individual students? Mm -hmm. Uh, I want to begin just by saying to Christy, and, and we've had the the opportunity to meet on several occasions, but I'm sorry what happened to your son, what was done to your son, and what, what happened to you and your family as well. Uh, as you know, um, I share your experience with my son and uh, understand how how painful this is. Uh, you know, I think what Christy shared is really very consistent with what we see. Uh, the families that we work with, um, you know, the the impact of trauma related to seclusion is significant. And what we're talking about here is, is not just trauma from the child that is actually secluded. We know that's traumatic. We know being put into a room against your will, not being let out leads to trauma. 
Uh, but we also know that it's traumatic for the teachers and educators that might be doing it. Uh, nobody secludes a kid because they want to. Uh, unfortunately, these things are happening in our schools often because it's it's culture and training. It's how people have been trained to respond in certain situations. Today, we can absolutely do much better. Uh, there are better things we can do to to better meet kids' needs. And, and the the beautiful thing is that we can eliminate things like seclusion and not only make things better for the kids, but also make them better for the teachers and staff as well. But it's important to understand the impact of trauma. Trauma changes our brain. And I don't mean that in a figurative way. There are actual changes that occur in the function and structure of our brain. Those changes lead to individuals that will be more apt to exhibit distressed behaviors, as Christy mentioned. Uh, they are more apt to be hypervigilant. And, and the, the ironic part is that while restraint and seclusion both are often used in the name of behavior, when you are secluding a child, you are traumatizing them, you are making it more likely that they will have distress-related behavior in the future. So you create a cycle, and the same holds true of the um, the educators as well. The more you do it, the more you might find yourself doing it. So I think it's important to, to realize when we talk about impact, it's not just impact on the student that it happens to and is done to, but it's also impact on students that witness it happening. If you're seeing one of your classmates being drug off to a seclusion room, that is traumatizing. If you are an educator that is involved in one of these events, it is traumatizing. And the impact on families. I talked to Christy recently about this. Um, we can we could relate because your entire family becomes impacted when suddenly your child is not your own anymore. Your child has been affected in such a way that as Christy described, you're seeing these behaviors at home. Uh, it took a while before I had my son back and I do today, but the impact is really significant. And at the end of the day, we can do better here. And, and if we can do better, I think we have an obligation to do better. And again, appreciate the work that everyone on this panel is doing to try to get there. And Guy, thank you for sharing your experiences with that as well. Jonathan, what legal concerns has the educational opportunities section confronted in this area and how have they been addressed? Thanks, Karen. Um, so our work has raised increasing concerns about the utility of seclusion and its discriminatory misuse. Um, so in our investigations, we've found patterns of improper seclusions targeting students with disabilities, which uh, violates the federal laws that forbid disability discrimination. State laws on this issue can, can vary quite a bit. Some states expressly prohibit seclusion um, or many others uh, sharply limit its use. But we have uncovered discriminatory seclusions even in schools where states uh, state laws severely limit the use of seclusion. So. For example, in states that say seclusion may be used only to prevent imminent physical harm, we find that schools still use seclusion on students with disabilities in situations that don't pose that kind of immediate risk of danger. Um, additionally, some states place a time limit on seclusions. But in those same states, we've found instances where schools still seclude students with disabilities for much longer than the allowed time under uh, permitted under state law. So I, you know, probably the bigger picture here is sort of given what the other panelists um, have, have shared so far during this discussion and, and based on our own work in the educational opportunities uh, section in this area, we certainly hope that school districts will um, proactively evaluate their own use of seclusion to sort of examine whether schools are using it discriminatorily as a substitute for appropriate classroom behavior management. Thank you, Jonathan. Jeanette, North Gibson School Corporation signed one of those agreements with DOJ that Jonathan was just talking about. It well, and it Karen, oh, I can sorry. talk a little bit. I can talk a oh. little bit more about the the agreements themselves as well. Sure, please um, do. Thanks. So we we have entered into, as uh, AAG Clark, the Assistant Attorney General, uh, mentioned at the outset of um, the discussion, we've entered into seven settlement agreements with school districts across the country um, recently to prohibit the use of discriminatory seclusions under Title II of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, and these agreements sort of include two central components. The first uh, component requires the district to end seclusion. Um, 
The second uh, component requires school districts to provide essential services and supports to students with disabilities in order to dramatically reduce or eliminate the need to restrain them. Um, the agreements also require districts to implement internal monitoring to make sure uh, district staff are not improperly restraining students as a substitute uh, for um, uh, you know, appropriate classroom management practices. Uh, additionally, school districts must provide significant training to help staff better manage and de-escalate student behavior. Uh, beyond the agreements that we've already reached, we also have ongoing investigations of districts large and small where we are concerned about the use of seclusion, as well as other practices that deprive students with disabilities of equal access to educational opportunities. And this, this sort of other bucket of, of concerns includes things like exclusionary discipline, referrals to law enforcement, schools requiring parents to pick up students with disabilities before the end of the school day and then inappropriately placing them on shortened day schedules or homebound instruction, that, that kind of, of, of practice. And we're continuing to identify districts that may be using seclusion in violation of federal civil rights laws, including uh, any use of seclusion that targets students based on their race or national origin. Jonathan, thanks for making sure we had that really important piece of information before I ask my next question. <laughs> You're the best. So Jeanette, North Gibson School Corporation signed one of those agreements that Jonathan was just talking about. It ended seclusion in North Gibson schools. You were hired by North Gibson after the agreement was signed to implement the settlement. Since the agreement was signed, there's been a huge turnaround and seclusion has ended and restraints have been drastically reduced. Can you tell us about that turnaround? What was the district's approach for better supporting its students? Sure, thanks for having me. And I wanna start by saying, Christy and Guy, I'm, I'm very sorry for what your families have had to go through and, and hopefully things like this can make things better for other families in the future. So thanks for sharing your story. Um, so when I started at North Gibson with the settlement agreement, by the time I had got here, they had eliminated all seclusion rooms and areas in all the schools within the district that had been used for seclusionary purposes. And then when I arrived, we started, we revised the policy um, to, to reflect the um, and prohibit the use of seclusionary practices. So that was the first big step. Um, in addition to my role here, the district did hire a behavior intervention specialist to help support the teachers um, and to help them learn better and more appropriate ways to handle challenging behaviors with students. A huge piece was prof professional development for the staff because I agree with you, nobody is intending to harm children. Um, it's been something that maybe they've been trained to do. It's been past practices. So big, the biggest piece um, for us was training staff and alternative things to do instead of these practices. Um, we shifted to a more proactive, rather, <clears throat> excuse me, rather than a reactive approach to supporting students, um, recognizing when a student is in distress earlier and then having some skills to deescalate earlier. Um, we look at behavior now as communicating a need rather than challenging authority. That's a huge piece. Um, and when you look at, at challenging behaviors as students trying to tell us that they need something, your reaction and the way you see that behavior is very different. Um, we have spent a lot of time in professional development with our special education staff, um, helping them, and we're still learning to do um, better functional behavior assessments and writing better behavior intervention plans that are meaningful, um, that everybody understands. And a, a huge piece has been also providing professional development for our teaching assistants, because quite often they're the ones that are spending the most time with our students with, with the um, significant needs. And we haven't really in public education spent enough time helping our, our teaching assistants know and have these skills to recognize and help de-escalate um, and just, just to be able to, 
to identify when a student may be asking for that help. So all of those pieces, like I said, it, we're still a work in progress, but um, the first step had to be, we're just not doing this anymore. And we have to figure this out. And, um, and we have made great progress here at North Gibson. Thanks, Jeanette, for sharing that experience and about how it's working on the ground. And Michael, I saw you nodding when Jeanette was talking. Um, we heard a bit from Jeanette about what's worked in North Gibson. Are there other alternatives to seclusions that districts should use to manage other, uh, to manage student behavior, Michael? The, uh, I mean, Jeanette touched on a number of the primary alternatives uh, at, at the, practice level sort of in the classroom with teachers and, and teaching assistants, paraprofessionals and so forth. Uh, at the at the training level, at the at, at the policy level, there are um, sort of there are alternatives um, that can be done and that are structured by the environment created by the trainings and policies and so forth. But um, you know, but stopping seclusion and uh, choosing to provide the appropriate behavioral support to students um, and behavioral management within classrooms is the primary alternative. And that includes things like that Jeanette talked about, like um, the, you know, de-escalating uh, techniques, um, you know, un having staff at all levels of staff that, that are primarily responsible for uh, interacting with kids and dealing with behaviors, having them all understand de-escalation and verbal um, interventions, understanding the uh, importance of teaching uh, pro-social behaviors. Um, a lot of times in classrooms, people go in and assume that kids know exactly what it is they're supposed to do or what it is you want them to do, how it is you, you expect them to behave. Um, and you know that's not necessarily the case. Part of the part of uh, an important part of uh, you know not allowing things to escalate to the point of you know serious behavioral challenges is to teach pro-social behaviors, um, to teach replacement behaviors. Uh, if once you understand, once you're conducting your FBAs and, and you have an understanding of the function of behaviors, it's important to, to at, the, at, the, at the classroom level, um, teach replacement behaviors to students, um, to you know, alter the environment um, in ways that are conducive to, to producing positive behaviors uh, for kids. Um, another important, a very important part of piece of this is to collect data and collect precise data within the classroom to understand uh, what's happening, to understand behaviors, to understand uh, the kinds of, uh, understand the indicators that precede uh, behavioral challenges in kids. Uh, without doing effective data uh, sort of collection and data analysis, um, you end up with people just sort of responding uh, out of habit um, responding out of emotion um, rather than having a you know sort of precise response that is attached to an understanding of students behavior behavioral patterns um, and you know doing things that are that are aligned with implementing uh, behavior intervention plans rather rather than you know just sort of out of response or, or emotional response um, you know, Jeanette talked about training, which, uh, you know, I couldn't agree more that that tends to be an important part of, uh, you know, avoiding the use of seclusion um, is, you know, there are a lot of people in those classrooms besides just teachers. We, we you know, there's there's a lot of emphasis that has been given to, given to uh, providing training to teachers on behavior management and classroom management and so forth. Um, or having them sit through to have an understanding of what FBAs are and implementing behavior intervention plans, but in my experience in a lot of locations, uh, the other behavioral, uh, the other people in the classroom or behavioral specialists or, or, or paraprofessionals are not given a, um, or not required to understand uh, behavior or not required to understand, you know, the details of what a FBA and a behavior intervention plan is so that they understand, um, you know, why they need to be implementing it with fidelity. Um, training and ensuring that there is training of all the individuals within the classroom that deal with kids and deal with behaviors um, is important and, and also to ensure and also ensuring that that training is not just you know a single professional development 
but it includes things like in-service coaching. It includes uh, ways to, um, you know, that includes basically accountability that tracks uh, whether whether staff are implementing behavior intervention plans, for example, with fidelity and offers them further training when when it is needed. Um, and that's something that can be uh, put in place through through uh, policy. Um, you know, sort of having those requirements for uh, you know collecting data on the fidelity of imp implementation of, of behavior intervention plans by the behavior interventionist, and then you know having that tied to uh, further training or further in-service coaching around doing things like um, you know using pro-social or, or using de-escalation or or implementing behavior intervention plans. So. Um, I think that those those are are important alternatives to put into place that prevent um, us from having to you know move to seclusion as well. I haven't not prevent us from moving to to seclusion as a means of dealing with challenging behaviors. And I, and I think the thing I forgot about the policy thing is also that that I think Jeanette uh, also touched on was um using at, at the school and at district level denormalizing sort of this culture of seclusion um is is sort of part of a, a first thing um it you know denormalizing that culture and ensuring that you know we're providing training on the kind of culture the kind of uh positive culture that we desire to have in schools and um, and implementing the data collection and data analysis to support the teachers in in enacting the sort of pro-social or, or positive behavioral supports um, that we want to see in classrooms. Michael, really quick follow up just yeah. for the lay person in the class. Yeah. Can you explain just really quickly what what pro social behavior means? Since I'm not, um, so it's it's okay. it's just trying. It's just teaching kids um, the kinds of the the ways you want them to uh, respond, the ways that that they can respond and interact with their peers and other individuals in in a, in productive uh, ways. Right. So you have. Uh, simply things like just the ways kids interact with each other, the ways kids um, sort of want it, when they want to say something in classroom or they want to interact in a conversation or they want to ask a question and so forth. It just very, it can be sort of really simple things like that, just getting them to understand here's how we can do this in a in a way that is not disruptive to the classroom. Um, if you you know, teaching them to, that also goes along with teaching them to understand themselves and, and when they are having uh, particular uh, difficulties or response, or they need a break, or they need, uh, they need something, they need to, I don't know, to take a walk, take a time. but understanding ways that they can interact and get what they need in productive ways, in positive ways, both sort of socially um, with their with their peers and with the adults around them and so forth. Uh, so it's it's what it's like. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for teaching. I know you're a teacher, so I, I appreciate the extra lesson. Um, Jeanette, what advice? Um, oh, sorry. I'm supposed to ask you, what has been the reaction of teachers and staff to the turnaround in North Gibson? And how has the district supported staff and gotten their buy-in? Well, um, initially it was it was rough. Change is hard. Um, initially, teachers were sort of resistant to the change. Um, we did have that extra nudge of a settlement agreement in the Department of Justice kind of pushing that um, forward. So that that you know, forced us to continue to move forward. Lots of um, discussions, lots of professional development, and then lots of modeling and seeing other ways to, to interact with students when they are in an escalated um, state, being able to model that, having the behavior inter intervention specialist be able to go into the classrooms, having myself be able to go into the classrooms, all of those pieces together uh, we meet monthly to review past practices, um, old incident reports. Those have proven to be 
so valuable to look through and 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 critique ourselves. What could we do better? What what maybe wasn't the best way to do things? It was really important for me to be able to help the staff move from we're doing this because we have to because of a Department of Justice settlement agreement to moving to we're doing this because it's it's what's best for kids. And I do believe that the majority of our staff at this point will say to you that what we were doing previously was harmful to students and we're not going to do that anymore. It takes time to do that. It takes a lot of hard discussions and a, and a lot of reflection on your own practices and your own beliefs on, on what you believe about behavior and, and challenging behavior. And, and then also recognizing um, that, that sometimes behavior is a reaction to some sensory needs. It's not just, um, there is no just cookie cutter reason for behaviors. So, I, I, I think we're in a really positive place now. Um, again, we started because we had to. I think we're in a place now where we know it's it's better and it's what's best for kids. So um, I think we've come a long way and we still have a lot of learning to do. It's still, you know, we're always going to be trying the next best thing for kids. But um, everybody's in a, in a comfortable place now and they've seen we don't have to do that. There's a lot of things at our disposal, a lot of things that we can do. And um, as far as the district, it, it has to come from your district level. It has to it has to require that our schools aren't going to treat children this way. That has to be the catalyst for the change, not the Department of Justice, not a settlement agreement, but your district leadership has to be the ones that say, this isn't acceptable at North Gibson or, or whatever school. And then those teachers that know better have to have the voice to stand up and, and, and speak out about it, too. Do you have, Jeanette, um, advice that you would give districts that want to make reforms like those in North Gibson? How should they go about it? Well, like I said, I think that I think that district leadership just needs to say unacceptable. I mean, we know now that we're harming kids. This is a harmful practice. And just because the state says we can doesn't mean that we should. And so I think that we just have to, we have to speak up and we have to say not here. And then we have to support teachers, find the funding to hire those behavior intervention specialists. If there's one piece that, that you have to have is that districts have to provide Someone with the knowledge within that district that can be there every day, that can be there when um, a student is, is is escalated to the where we we've exhausted all we know. We need somebody else to help us. Districts have to find the money to provide that support within within their own district. Um, and we can't bring in, you know, we're, we're real good at bringing in professional development for a day. And they give us all of the information and then they're gone. Um, and so having in-house people, I think, to oversee, to, to bring it to the attention of people when that's, that's not appropriate, how we handled that was not appropriate, here's how we have to move forward. So you have to have those people in-house. Michael, do you have um, anything that you want to add in terms of how districts should go about it if they want to make these types of reforms? Um, this is to sort of dovetail on what Jeanette, Jeanette just said. I, I think um, it is one of the most important things is to have the this the internal person who is focused on um, both the development of staff around dealing with behaviors and managing behaviors, but also uh, the piece that I talked about, about around the data and the analysis of data and um, someone who's responsible for uh, having some sort of a, having a flagging system that identifies when there are consistent behavioral pop problems popping up within within schools, within a classroom, uh, within individual students um, to go in and, you know, have an analyze what was happening um what's the nature of the problem determine whether you know whether uh you know maybe the behavior intervention plan is not working is not correct because this particular student is having the same sort of problem over and over again um someone has to be 
re responsible for overseeing that that those sorts of ongoing analyses are happening so that um and, and it's not also important that to, it's not someone from the outside someone it's not someone something that comes from you know somebody in you know the department of justice or or wherever but someone who is within the district and responsible for working with teachers and working with staff to improve um their support of students and identifying where and why there are failings within that system because um you know one of the things that you're always in fear of is this sort of like moving of <laughs> the the sort of the the moving of the categories of bad behavioral responses so if you eliminate seclusion you don't want it to pop up elsewhere there are greater numbers of restraints, greater numbers of suspensions. And so, so someone has to be responsible for making sure that that's not happening and, and analyzing sort of how are we responding to behavior um, each and every time on a consistent basis to, to support um, maintaining this, this uh, no seclusion uh, moving forward. Candace, do you wanna add anything? I was going to say basically everything Michael just said, so I'll, I'll add on to that. Uh, I echo both Michael and Jeanette in uh, the importance of data and also of having um, someone in-house who is a an inter behavior intervention specialist or someone who understands behavior, but also, you know, you know, along with that position, having someone that has that knowledge that is at a central administration level, I think is really important. Um, and have that person be kind of lead this data analysis and reflection. I think it's really important for staff uh, at all levels to be uh, self-accountable and to use reflective practices because there will be escalations, there will be incidents, but being able to review that information and understand like, okay, what did we do wrong? What did, could we have done better? Um, did we do everything right? And there's something that needs to be changed in this student's, um, you know, behavior plan. Uh, and understanding that and um, also, you know, looking at those patterns, as Michael mentioned, is really important. I think you have to look at the data to understand those root causes and you, in order to understand the root causes um, and, and use the data, then you can address them in meaningful ways. You can do things like policy change or additional staff training. I think Jeanette's spot on with the importance of professional development. And I also have to put in um, as a higher education representative, uh, we don't do a great job of training teachers at the outset. And so we also need to do a better job of you know, training all teachers to do effective behavior management strategies and classroom management strategies and understanding how to um, create functional behavioral assessments and uh, function-based behavioral intervention plans. Um, one last thing I would suggest as, as advice is keep seclusion out of functional behavioral assessments, obviously, and then definitely out of behavioral intervention plans in any place in the IEP. Um, that is not an educational practice. It is a, uh, in appropriate safety response. If you do bring in outside professional development um, people, then to continue that work in-house and, and make it an ongoing practice, um, the one and done is, is just not the way to go. I have to say, as our in-house data analysis expert, I'm very tempted to just ask a million questions about data analysis and let us talk about that for the rest of this time. But I have a few more important questions that I probably should get to. Um, and one of them is for Christy. Um, what advice do you have for parents or guardians whose child has been secluded? Thank you, that's a really uh, great question. Um, first, I'd like to say that um, I understand how difficult it is to see um, the impact of that on your child and not really know where to go and who to turn to and and how to get that to stop. So I would um, suggest finding an advocate uh, to help um, you and, and the journey that it will take to get change to come. I also um, hope that everyone attending this 
um, passes on this information to their friends and family and um, acknowledge that this is a practice that needs to stop. But I also want to um, say that just keep fighting for your child's rights and for the rights of all these kids that they're looking to us as adults to be the calm and to do right by them. Thank you. Bye. Would you like to add advice for parents or, ch or guardians whose child sure. is included? Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to. Uh, you know, the, the first thing I would say is um, don't blame your child. Support your child. Uh, the one point I want to make is that whenever I talk to a family of a child that's been secluded, um, you know, what's really happening here is a failure to meet that child's needs. This is not a matter of just behavior. This is that we fail to meet that child's needs. We're seeing dysregulated behavior because we have not met that child's needs. So, you know, there's a temptation to blame the child, want to fix the child. And of course, this happens to a lot of neurodivergent individuals who are, who are, you know, wiredly differently, but no lesser. We are, we are human beings and this is not about uh, blame or shame. So it's really important as families because very often, you know, a family might feel like, well, why me? Why is, why is my child doing this? And again, you know, when I see a child that becomes so dysregulated that they become, that they are secluded or restrained, uh, they're the victim here um, and we need to help them and support them. In terms of advice for families, uh, the first thing I would say is, one, anyone that's going through this, reach out to us, reach out to the Alliance Against Seclusion and Restraint. Uh, we work with, that's one of the things that we do. We work with families across the, the country and beyond. Uh, you know, I know we don't have a lot of time here today, but, you know, we can talk to you about your your options, anything from working with the district to support change to what if you have to file a complaint? You know, what are the different processes you can go through? Um, so, you know, we're always here to help people that might be going through this. Uh, you know, we've got a amazing team of volunteers, many of whom have experiences as well. And, and we've got a lot of educators on our on our team here also. So, you know, definitely reach out for help. I started the Alliance because I wanted people to know that they weren't alone, but I also wanted them to know that they could influence change. And I believe that, you know, uh, as I listen to Christy and, you know, we've, we've, you know, talked many times and I know the work that Christy has been doing to try to bring about greater change. All of us that are on this call and, and the DOJ um, very much included are people that are trying to influence change. So know that you're not alone and that you can do things to influence change and support your child. This is really a difficult time. Jonathan, anything you want to add? Yeah, I'll, I'll just add, um, just to remind everybody, like at the outset, um, Assistant Attorney General Clark mentioned um, that if the parents think their, their child has been subjected to, dis to seclusion in a discriminatory manner, they can absolutely file a complaint with the Civil Rights Division directly um, at our complaint portal website, which uh, the link was dropped in the chat earlier, but I think it just reappeared. Um, uh, so, so you can let us know if you're seeing a problem uh, that's directly affecting your child or, you know, with your school community. Parents can also visit the Educational Opportunity Section's website uh, that's specifically targeted to this topic of se seclusion and highlights our work in this area. Karen um, and uh, Jim Eichner and others in our office did a, a wonderful job putting that together very recently. Um, and um, on our seclusion website, we've pu publicly posted the, the letters that we've sent to school districts describing the results of our investigations, where we sort of explain why we found that their seclusion practices violated federal law. We've also publicly posted copies of our settlement agreements. And so, so parents, advocates, and, and educators can certainly use these resources to engage with their local school communities, elevate the issue, and, and work to affect change in their districts on, on their own too. So. And I'll just add that if you do file a complaint through our portal, it will very quickly make its way to an actual human like me or Jonathan. Um, so there are humans on this end. Um, so uh, as we get ready to wrap up the formal Q&A, um, I wanted to ask an, uh, a question to most of you, and I'll start with Guy, because you're the most left on my screen. What message would you give to districts about the use of seclusion? Seclusion is never appropriate. I mean, honestly, um, 
you know, this is something we would not be doing to any human being, putting them in a room area against their will and not letting them out. It's not helpful. It's not teaching a, a child a skill or, or somehow therapeutic to children. And in fact, is likely to lead to an increase in behaviors. There are far better things we can and should do to support children, to support teachers and staff. And the same solutions, again, that will improve things for our students, will improve things for the teachers and staff. We've seen places that have gotten rid of seclusion, and I'd love to connect later with Jeanette, but places that have gotten rid of seclusion or reduced the use of restraint. And what they found is they've actually increased the teacher satisfaction. They've decreased staff turnover. So doing better things has in itself a, a better result and, and can really make a, a huge difference. So, you know, one of my advice for districts would be, you know, don't, I mean, honestly, uh, and I say this often, don't wait for the Department of Justice to come knocking on your door. I happen to know that you're, you're lovely people and that you're doing important work, but no district wants to come under investigation by the U.S. Department of Justice. You know, if you have seclusion rooms that are in your um, special education classrooms, you are probably discriminating against children with disabilities. Uh, and that's where we find them most often. So I would encourage districts to be proactive. This is about changing adult mindset. This is not about changing children or youth. Uh, this is about bringing in a trauma-informed approach bring in neuroscience, bring in relationship-driven approaches and collaborating with kids. It's not about doing things to kids, it's about working with them. And again, you know, back to the, the, the thing I say often, which is if we can do better, we have an obligation to. And I believe it's really important to go upstream. Even de-escalation, uh, which is something that we of course want people to know how to do, that's later in the process. We need to go upstream and prevent these things from happening. Uh, there's a great quote by uh, Reverend Desmond Tutu about rather than pulling people out of the river, let's go upstream and figure out why they're falling in. Rather than waiting for children to become dysregulated, let's go up and better meet their needs. When we meet their needs, we're gonna have solutions and they're gonna be better for all. Thank you. Um, I wanna go to Candace on this question. What message would you give districts about the use of seclusion? Hopefully I'll come in this time. Uh, really, it's just that there are alternatives and you can do it. And um, it is not um, out of the question to eliminate seclusion and also meet the needs of the students and, and to keep everybody safe. Thank you. Um, so I know that I said that I was gonna ask for everybody to weigh in on that, but we have a ton of questions coming in from people and I wanna make sure that we get a chance to answer them. Um, although unfortunately we won't get to everybody. Um, the first question was for Michael. Uh, the panel explained that seclusion means uh, that the student can't leave. What if a teacher asserts that a student has agency to leave by choosing to act in a calm manner? Is that seclusion? You're saying the student has agency to leave. Ah, okay, but the student is still prevented from leaving until the adult has determined that the student is calm. That's still seclusion. There's absolutely seclusion anytime a student is prevented from leaving a room space, whatever they are calling it, whatever sort of cabin, there, there are no conditions, there should be no conditions on a student being able to freely uh, move. And if there are conditions, then it is seclusion. And similarly, uh, Candace, what if having a separate quiet space helps a child calm down? Is that seclusion? If the child is not able to leave that space or is, is made to go to that space and there is no um, instruction going on, there is no um, interaction with the adult to, to calm the child then and, and the child is not able to leave, then it is seclusion. And, and I want to add that it doesn't have to be a, a specified room or space. It could also be a conference room. It could be a bathroom. It could be um, an, a closet. It could be other rooms used, designated for other purposes. If the child is not able to leave on their own, it is seclusion. Jonathan, is there a statute of limitations on filing a seclusion complaint with DOJ? Uh, with the Department of Justice, there's there's no you know hard and fast rule, but obviously for, for us, we'd like to um, get your complaint 
uh, um, as soon as possible um, in, in terms of uh, the uh, relationship and in, in terms of when the events actually occurred. Uh, there's, there's, you know, a need to, to want to uh, preserve the evidence, witnesses, uh, memories uh, fade, documents um, can 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 go missing. Um, so it is important to to let us know um, if there's a you have a concern as as soon as possible. Um, and you know our our investigations tend to be very comprehensive, and we ask for a lot of documents. We um, will um, uh, interview central office um, administrators. We'll talk to. We'll actually physically go on site, on site to school communities, visit classrooms, visit seclusion rooms, talk to teachers um, and, and educators about um, the incidents that we're seeing in the documents that the district is reporting to us. So, truly, to do all of that work to um, to, to 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 really suss out whether there is a, a discriminate a violation of federal anti discrimination laws, uh, we, we need to be able to. Uh, explore that evidence close in, in time. So um, it's just sort of a, a practical uh, reality. Thanks. Um, somebody had a follow-up for Candace. Um, Candace, are calming areas in classrooms okay? There isn't a whole lot of research on this in this area in terms of in classrooms. But yes, there is research on, you know, using uh, things like breathing and meditation uh, to support students. However, um, again, if that calling area is used in a way that a student either has to comply with certain demands to leave or is, is, is um, kept there by uh, either adults standing in the way or some sort of, um, you know, furniture uh, keeping them from leaving, uh, then it would be seclusion. Uh, there are plenty of classrooms, though, that use these calming areas. And if it's a place where students can go freely at any time or during designated times, as spelled out in a class's um, uh, behavior management plan or class ma classroom management plan, then that would be okay. But if the student is not able to leave on their own accord or is sent there and not able to leave um, until they comply, then it's seclusion. Thanks. Guy, how do you make the general public aware of these practices and how can I find out if my child's school district uses seclusion? Uh, let's start with the, the last part of the question, which is uh, I would ask, uh, and, and you may have answers that aren't always clear. Um, you know, as somebody acknowledged earlier, and we were just kind of talking about, um, what makes seclusion seclusion is not what you call the room. And I've seen rooms called cool room, blue room, calm room. Uh, there was one recently called Alaska, uh, place for kids to go chill out. You know, you hear all these things. What matters is how these rooms are being used. If you're putting a child in a room against their will and not letting them out, it, it is seclusion. So ask, but, but, you know, um, ask, you know, and, and follow your instincts. Um, reach out to an organization like ours or others if you have concerns about, you know, what you might be um, seeing. In terms of more awareness, I mean, that's part of the work that uh, the Alliance is trying to do and part of the, the work that people like Christy are doing by, uh, you know, providing interviews in the media and in newspapers to, to talk about these issues. Uh, one thing I will tell you, tell you, though, is that Although many of us on this call would probably agree that there's a lot to be outraged about here, uh, not everybody in the general public will agree with us. Uh, there are many people that believe that things like corporal punishment in schools are okay, despite the fact that there's mountains of data to say otherwise. And people often, uh, without knowing the situations, are very judgmental of our children with disabilities, of the black and brown children that are affected, of children with a trauma history that are affected by this. So at any rate, you know, we certainly want to raise awareness. And there have been many cases where investigative journalists have done stories that have led to changes in legislation. Uh, in Illinois, there was a huge story called the uh, quiet rooms. It led to change in Illinois. I mean, not to say that was the only thing happening, but it influenced change in New York recently. Uh, some of the, the stories led to change. The Department of Justice investigations 
are leading the change. In fact, um, our, um, in Maryland, uh, about a year and a half ago, we passed legislation to ban seclusion in all our public schools. Uh, that happened kind of on the heels of a DOJ investigation. Uh, while we were pushing that forward uh, prior to that investigation, the fact that that investigation happened raised awareness. So uh, speak up, speak out, share your stories, contact uh, like-minded organizations, and not just us, the, you know, the ARC of the United States. There's others that are, you know, really interested in these issues. So um, there are things we can do to influence change and we need to do them. Thank you. Well, everybody, I think we've set a record. We have 53 questions in the Q&A and unfortunately we're gonna be here till 2 p.m. I'm just kidding. Um, I think we're gonna have to wrap up, but I hope that this has started or continued an important discussion for everybody. Um, and that's all the time that we have for questions today. Um, I wanna thank our wonderful panelists for sharing their experiences and wisdom and Assistant Attorney General Kristen Clark for being part of our program and lively discussion. And a special thanks to everyone in the audience for your excellent 54 questions and for taking the time out of your day to join us. And we hope that you found the program um, meaningful and, and informative. Uh, so thank you all and have a great rest of your day. Bye everybody.